Okay. So last time uh, we talked about Savage's theorem. Uh, basically, it says that you can get rid of a non-determinism aspect of a space-bounded computation uh, by squaring uh, the space at most. So you don't have to more than square the space, which is good. It's a pretty uh, small price to pay, given that other ways of getting rid of non-determinism involve exponentiating various things, like time or number of states in the case of finite automata. So this theorem was proven by a heavy reuse of space. Uh, you basically simulate the entire non-deterministic tree, and it's a very deep tree. In, in, in a certain amount of space, you can have very long computations, exponentially long computations. You've got to simulate the tree of exponential depth by using a lot of space, divide and conquer. You pick midpoints, and you see if they're able to reach them recursively through more midpoints or midpoints of those. Anyway, very heavy reuse of space. And, uh, but the whole thing is working in quadratic <coughs> space deterministically, which is nice. Um, certain corollaries of that immediately follows. The non-deterministic polynomial space is the same as the deterministic polynomial space because every non-deterministic space class contains is contained in the deterministic square space. Uh, so together, all the polynomial spaces um, are the same as the deterministic or non-deterministic versions of each other. So, so this is kind of the p is equal to np question with respect to space, uh, and that's. Just a corollary of Savage's theorem. For time, we still don't know. It's open. Immerman's theorem, we mentioned um, non deterministic space is closed under complementation. So if you have a non deterministic computation in a certain amount of space, you can do the complement language, recognize a complement language within the same space. Not trivial, because for complementation in non deterministic computations, you can't just flip the bit around. You have to explore the whole tree and then do the opposite. Right. So. Uh, Similar idea to Savage's theorem, heavy reuse of space. But for time, we still don't know if non deterministic polynomial time is the same as co non deterministic polynomial time. The complements of all the NP languages can be recognized uh, the same as the NP languages if they coincide, these two classes. That's still open. And we refer to a book that has proofs of this theorem, the Immerman theorem, and uh, we mentioned that. So, in terms of the Chomsky hierarchy, we have a couple of extra classes now. Uh, non deterministic space, same as deterministic space. Co non deterministic space, the same as non deterministic space. And that generalizes to other uh, categories of space. Um, so we talked about the denseness of the space hierarchy. I think we did that, right? We said that a little bit of extra space, asymptotically speaking, is enough to get you more languages. For time, it's not as tight. You need at least log factor more time to get more languages. But they're both dense hierarchies. We gave some examples of containments, proper containments. We also mentioned that there's many open problems, not just p is equal to np, but all these other conjectures are still open. But for some of them, we know that among certain groups, at least one of them or two of them must be true. So at least two of the above conjectures are true that the class is not equal to the next class. We don't know if it's p is equal to np or some of the others. But we know for sure that log time is not the same as polynomial time, because by the space and time dense hierarchy theorems, when you have, you have more time, you can recognize more languages. So one of these three is not a proper containment, at least one. Possibly two, possibly all three, and more likely all three. And same for this blue one and this blue one. Exponential space is strictly bigger than polynomial space in terms of the class of languages that it can be recognized there. So some of these conjectures must be true. We just don't know which ones, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we mentioned that some other esoteric results include we know that p is not equal to linear space, but we don't know which way, which way it goes, whether one is contained in the other or vice versa. It could be that they're just incomparable, that either one contains languages not containing the other. That's possible, too. But amazingly, we still can't even prove that. But we know they're not the same. That much we can't prove. Uh, so at least two of these conjectures are um, true. Uh, probably all of them are true. So there's lots more open problems than there are solutions or proofs or known uh, theorems. And that's just the nature of complexity theory. Um, it's very hard to reason about large aggregates of computations all at the same time, like all possible Turing machines running in polynomial time, all computations running in exponential space or whatever it is. Um, 
So uh, there's many other complexity classes now we can add to this uh, Chomsky hierarchy. Uh, so you have infinite space and time hierarchies. So there's infinite hierarchy of polynomials, the polynomial time and space classes within P and P space respectively. Right, so every larger polynomial, linear, quadratic, cubic, and so on, has more languages that can be recognized with the smaller polynomials in terms of time bounds. Same for the space, and same for inside P and inside P space. So these are infinite hierarchies, and here I'm deviating from the Venn diagramness of this rest of the diagram, because technically speaking, all these purple circles should enclose everything below them you know, within P. But if I did that, it would be one big mess of a diagram. So I'm representing it now this way. So but I'm just bringing it to your attention that these purple circles represent infinite hierarchies, proper containments, proper containments, known proper containments, not open problems, within each one of those classes. And there's plenty of other infinite hierarchies all over the place, up and down this Chomsky hierarchy. So within P space, you have all polynomial space, linear space, quadratic space, cubic space, and everything in between. You know, space to n log n, space n log squared n, space n to the 1 and a half, n to, you know, to the 1.999, that's less than quadratic. Uh, they're all there. Uh, so now we can kind of adorn this uh, extended Chomsky hierarchy with more and more space complexity classes and time complexity classes. So like a Christmas tree, we keep hanging things off this diagram more and more as time goes by. And you have now a better idea of, of all the complexity and richness of all these uh, classes and their interrelationships. And there's other complexity classes and descriptive hierarchies, all of which are infinite, all over the place as well. We talked about star height you know, for finite languages. Turing degrees, we talked about a lot about that already. There's infinite hierarchies of more and more impossible things, things that you cannot do, but some are more impossible than others, meaning you can use an oracle for one and you still can't do the other, which means the other is more impossible than the first. So there's more and more infinite hierarchies all over the place. Even within the deterministic context tree, there's hierarchies of look ahead, how many tokens you can look ahead and still recognize the language. Compilers do that a lot. Uh, even within the regular languages, we mentioned star height, finite language, you can sort of them by uh, the length of the language, how many strings are in it, the cardinality of the language, and then you can get infinite hierarchies things uh, there too. Here's a really cool theorem. Uh, so it turns out there's arbitrarily large gaps in the complexity of space and time hierarchies as well. Now, these complexity gaps arise when the uh, space or time bounds themselves are not computable. Okay, so let me give you the theorem, and then you'll see how bizarre and unbelievable it is. So for any computable function g that you give me, I can find some function t such that the deterministic time t is equal to the deterministic time g of t. Remember, you get to pick g, and I will find such a t. So for example, there's a, a, a time class where the deterministic time t is equal to the deterministic time 2 to the 2 to the t. In other words, there's no language in between these two. Now, how, how does that not contradict the space and time hierarchy theorems? It says if you have a little bit more time by a log factor, you get new languages, because this is a double exponential gap between t and 2 to the 2 to the t. Well, the short answer is that t is not computable. t is constructed in a special way that diagonalizes over all the computable functions in a way that you know, makes it not computable and avoids all languages that can be recognized within you know, time um, uh, 2 to the 2 to the t. And it's, it's pretty esoteric, but it uses diagonalization again. And it creates arbitrarily long gaps, arbitrarily large gaps in space and in time. These terms are true for space and some time, uh, and, and, and in time as well, bounds. So for example, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a space bound S such that the deterministic space S is the same as the deterministic space S to the S. And you can make this arbitrarily large. Um, so these are consequences of these gap theorems. And again, they're proven by diagonalization. And these uh, bounds um, S are not computable necessarily. They're not computable functions necessarily. So you lift the restriction that the time and space bounds must themselves be computable and you get weird pathological behaviors like this. Because for computable function, computable bounds, this can't be. If you have more space, you can recognize more languages. And the same for time. So these don't contradict 
the hierarchy, the dense, the denseness of the space and time hierarchies, they just give you kind of some amazing pathological behaviors when the space and time bounds are not themselves computable. So, so these aren't nice bounds like squared or cubed or exponential or factorial or double exponential or something like that. These are really weird functions. They, they're monotonic and they keep growing, but they grow in such a weird, bizarre way that manages to bypass all the languages between the lower class and the higher class. Um, and that's how you, you prove these gap theorems. I hope that makes sense. Uh, even the statement of that theorem is you know, hard to wrap your mind around. Okay. You know, so for example, there exists functions such that deterministic time f is the same as deterministic space f. But f here will be very esoteric function. Okay. So here I'm saying that this does not contradict the space and time hierarchies because these bounds t and s and f are not necessarily computable. Uh, a any questions about that? I mean, that's, it's, uh, that's like almost kind of unbelievable that this is true. I mean, there are a lot of other, other unbelievable statements that we've proven in this course so far. Like that, you know, not all infinities are created equal. Some are bigger than others. That was kind of hard to believe, right? Not, you know, to mention that uh, some problems are more impossible than other impossible problems. There's levels of impossibility, even though none of them can be done. Computation, that's kind of unbelievable. This is even more esoteric than that, uh, if you think about it. Okay, so the first complexity gap is between constant and log log. So what does that mean? That any language that's in space, in the deterministic space, smaller, little o, smaller than log log, is also in constant space, which means it's regular. Because regular languages can be recognized in constant space. It's an if and only if. So that means between constant space and log log space, there are no languages in between. There's a gap. Uh, how many understand the statement of that theorem? It's only about half of you that even say you understand what I just said. So I'm not even try, trying to prove this. I'm just stating the fact. So it's only half of you. Let me, let me restate it. This says that there's a space gap between constant and log log space, which means any language that requires less than log log space doesn't require any space at all can also be recognized without any space, with constant space, which means it can be recognized by a finite automata, which means it's regular. In other words, less than log log space is useless. You can't do anything with it computationally. That's what this says. How many get the statement? OK, any questions about that? That's hard to prove. We're not proving it here. For extra credit, you can go out and chase down the proof and let me know what you think. You know, you can do a deep dive into this result, and uh, but we're not going to spend hours of class time on that one result. It's 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 deep. But that's an example of a collapse. So anything less than log log collapses to zero, to no space at all or constant space. It's equivalent. Um, intuitively, you know, why is that true? If you have log space, you can use a counter. You can count from 0 to n in log n bits. How many get that? So, so if you have log space, you can count. And if you can count, you can recognize things like 0 to the n, 1 to the n, which you can't do with a finite automata. Why? You know, so count the zeros, subtract against the count of the ones, and then you see if you back to 0. So a counter will count you the zeros up to n. And that's log n bits. So log n is very useful. You have a counter. Finite automata doesn't have a counter. Log log n bits, you can't have a counter from 0 to n, but you can count how many bits you have in a counter. Right? Because a counter is log n, and the count of the number of bits in the counter is log log n. And that's still useful, because there's a few things you can do by counting the bits in the counter, but not having a counter in of itself. Next, if you have less than log log n bits, you can't even count the bits in the counter. And it's, it's not completely obvious. It's definitely not obvious at all. That means you can't do anything useful with that. You can't even count the bits in the counter, so you can have a really tiny count, but that doesn't do you any good. And just to see where you are in the counter, because when you have bits, 
you have to figure out where you are. And as you walk across the bits, you have to count how many bits into the segment of memory you have. And that is a counter over here. That's a log of number of bits in the actual space. But if that bit space is already log n, the counter into that is log log n. And it, if that's all the space you have. You have less space than that. You can't even count into a counter. So you can't even count a counter up anymore. So that's sort of the intuition. It's not a proof. It's just an intuition why if you have little enough space, it becomes useless. Um, I guess real life situations, you know, if you have little enough money, that becomes useless too. So if you have less than a penny, you might as well have zero because there's no sub-penny denominations. I mean, how are you going to even pay somebody a tenth <coughs> of a penny or a millionth of a penny? Or, you know, there's, not, there's not a currency identified with that. And uh, you know, even bank accounts only have two digits. You know, a bank account is not going to go, OK, you have you know, 10 to the minus 12 you know, pennies in your bank account. You know, there's not enough digits in, in, on your bank statement to denote stuff like that. So, Bitcoin actually makes an end run by, by allowing real numbers. So, you know, by allowing, you can have a millionth of a Bitcoin, actually. Or even a billionth of a Bitcoin, I suppose. I'm, I'm not sure what the resolution of, what is the resolution of Bitcoin, by the way? Yeah, I mean, yeah. But, but normal dollars, yen, euros, there's a, there's a minimum denomination below which you might as well have zero. So that's sort of what this is here. Below log log. You might as well not have any space. OK. Uh, here's another esoteric theorem. This, this is, again, a very weird pathology. Uh, and again, it comes from lifting the restriction that the space and time bounds actually must com be themselves computable. And here's what it says. It says that there are languages for which there are no asymptotic best algorithm to decide them or compute them. So more formally, for any computable function g, there exists a language such that if a Turing machine accepts that language within time t, there's another Turing machine that accepts that language within time g of t, and you get to pick g. g could be like the log, for example. So what does that mean? Is that, you know, there, are, there are problems, or languages, or functions, if you will, that can be computed or recognized, however you want to think about it, in time log in time t, and there's another algorithm for it that can recognize in time log of t, and another algorithm for it that can recognize in time log of log of t, and so on and so on. And all these are valid algorithms that recognize a language or, so, or compute the function arbitrarily fast, asymptotically. In other words, there's no minimum speed. There's no lower bound on the speed of all algorithms to solve this function or recognize this language. Such languages do exist. Now, the trick here, again, is that t is not necessarily a computable function. It reverts back to the esotericness of certain functions that when you use them as, as time or space bounds, all bets are off. You know, they're very weird functions. Question. In practice, it, uh, it never happens. Uh, but they do exist. These languages exist for which there's no best algorithm. So this whole notion that we have in practice that every algorithm, like sorting, for example, uh, you know, putting things in order, uh, has a best algorithm like merge sort. It's n log n. And n log n is also a lower bound for merge sh for for sorting in general. Uh, that notion here disappears. It's it's not necessarily the case for every problem. And these languages are very esoteric also. So not only the time bound is esoteric, the language is esoteric too. It, it, it's, it's usually constructed by diagonalization over an you know, infinite class of languages. It's weird that this, is, this can even happen, even, even in a weird contrived scenario that this could be true. You would think that every language has some sort of a lower bound. Every function has a lower bound of how fast you can compute it, whether it's linear or n log n or some other thing. But, but this, this is the case. So, so the problem, or the language itself, has no inherent complexity. Yeah? Uh, is there a uh, restriction or a constraint of space is up for time and time is up for 
Uh, no, it's, it's true for both space and time. So yeah. in these algorithms, would the space be different, any different? Can the space complexity? Oh, uh, yeah. So we talk about the time complexity going down and down. Um, the space may also vary, but it's certainly not going to exceed the time because you cannot use more space than you have time to use. So the space will always be less than the time, but it won't necessarily be equal to the time. Or, you know, it, it could also vary quite a bit. So what we talked about before was like if you, if you go uh, higher up the hierarchy for, for space, do you find uh, faster algorithms for time as well? Uh, yes. So would that be a part of this? Uh, uh, yes. Y y you may need to use more and more space as you go down this, but the space will not exceed the time. And, and, and so you know, the, space, the space doesn't have to be constant across all these algorithms, but it's not going to increase the t you know, it's not going to be faster than you know, more space than time. But keep in mind that the time bound and the space bounds will be non-computable necessarily. And so, it, so it's hard to even wrap your mind around what's the time bound if it itself is not computable. So it's not quadratic or cubic or linear or exponential. It's some weird time bound that just, you know, is formed by diagonalizing over lots of other things. And it's very hard to wrap your mind intuitively around what the bound really is. Um, for every n, t of n is defined. But it, it doesn't grow like a parabola or cubic or linear or exponential. It, it, it look, it, it, it's almost like a fractal, is what it is. It's formed by diagonalization. Yeah. Uh, are there uh, uh, problems for which you can show speed up like this, where it does, uh, where there is like a linear or not uh, or quadratic trade-off? Uh, where, like, where like the algorithm uh, running time is just a function of the of the of the time. Uh, so so. Uh, in real life, you often see a sequence of algorithms that are faster and faster and faster. And it could happen within some um, bounded range. So for example, matrix multiplication. There's a very straightforward n cubed algorithm. Just you know, take the dot product, the rows and columns, and you got yourself you know, two n by n matrices. You got yourself a matrix multiplication algorithm. Now Strassen, I think we covered that in algorithms, uh, came up with a 2 to the log uh, n to the two, me, n to the log base two of seven rather than eight. So it's matrix multiplication algorithm with, ex with, ex with, with complexity of in time of n to the two point eight or something, two point eight instead of three. That's a faster algorithm. And people have discovered faster and faster matrix multiplication algorithms over the years. Dozens and dozens of new improvements on the time. People, somebody discovered then you know n to the two point seven, n to the two point five, n to the two point three six and to the 2.35, and to the 2.354, and, and, and it kind of asymptotes around 2.3, roughly, in the exponent. But it could be one of those. Makes replication may be one of these, where there's faster and faster algorithms that are, you know, slivery faster than the, the previous known polynomial exponent. Um, but there's faster and faster algorithms still forever. And it doesn't mean that it, it gets to zero. It doesn't mean that you can multiply two, two, two matrices in zero time. That's absurd. Right? It, it's at least n squared time because the, the data size is n squared. You've got to look at all the data elements for the answer to even be correct. But it could be like Zeno's paradox. Like to, to, get, to get to the wall, you go half the distance, and then half the distance, and then half the distance, and then half the distance. And you never get to the wall, but you just get closer and closer and closer. So it could be one of those situations for matrix multiplication. I'm not saying it is, but I'll give you a more concrete real life example where it might be. Um, okay, so that's the speed up theorem. And if you want to take a deeper dive into this, uh, look at chapter 32 of Dexter Cozen's book on the theory of computation. And uh, it talks about gap theorem and these other pathologies that I mentioned. And it has proofs for that. The proofs are not that long. There's a proof of the gap theorem. It's only a few paragraphs, three paragraphs, two paragraphs. Uh, there's a speed up theorem. Again, it's only a couple, couple more pages, and it proves it. So for a deeper dive, read those few pages, you know, extra credit even, you know, and tell me what you think and see if it makes sense.
uh, but it, you know, it's not worth spending hours of class time on this, and it gets pretty esoteric. So I'll just show it to you, tell you where to look, in the, namely in this book. Right? And this book is on a web page. You can get it down, download it for free. Uh, you know, let me just say it's not an Amazon bestseller or anything. You know, it's a very deep, complexity theory kind of book. You know, there's probably only a few hundred people in the world that understand everything in this book. Um, but uh, you can you can look at it up there, or you know, on the wiki pages or elsewhere too. There's lots of places where these theorems were known since the 1960s and 70s. You know, so they're, they're nothing new. Now. Here's something even more abstract. If you, if you thought this was abstract enough, then get a load of this. Complexity theory could be completely machine independent. You can completely decouple complexity theory from time and space. What does that mean? Uh, it means that, remember we talked about other resources. We talked about t time and space conservation while you compute. You know, those are the natural resources you want to minimize. But we talked about minimizing power, minimizing uh, page faults, minimizing uh, cache misses when you compute, minimizing bit flips, minimizing messages sent across the internet. There's dozens and dozens, hundreds of different resources you may, you may want to minimize as you, as you compute, not just space and not just time. So this theorem here decouples complexity theory from space and time, and it shows that any, s any resource whatsoever that satisfies two very simple axioms immediately will give rise to all of abstract complexity theory with all the space hierarchy, oh, oh, I, should, I shouldn't say space, I should say resource hierarchy now, because it's general. Uh, resource hierarchy theorems, the denseness theorems, the gap theorem, the speed up theorem, and all the other theorems of complexity will arise immediately if the resource you're conserving while you compute satisfies two very simple axioms, and here they are. We call this complexity measure B, or whatever you want to call it, uh, but if it satisfies the notion that for an arbitrary machine, an arbitrary input, if that computation is finite, if it halts, um, if, if that computation halts, the, the complexity count, the, the measure of the complexity is finite. In other words, for computations that halt, you don't consume an infinite amount of resources. Very reasonable axiom. How would you compute infinite space or infinite time or infinite energy or infinite cache misses or infinite page faults if the computation halts after a while. So that's, that's the first innocuous theorem. The second theorem is, is also very simple. It says that you can decide, you can compute how much, com how much resources you use. That's all. That's all it says. The amount of resources you use in the computation is computable, as opposed to being uncomputable or undecidable. So if somebody says, how much space did you use? How much time did you use? You say, I don't know. I can't compute it. Well, that's not one of these. But for any reasonable resource, like space and time, page faults, power, and, you, know, you can easily compute how much resources you're using when you run M and W, some arbitrary machine on arbitrary input, or arbitrary program on an arbitrary file. You can easily compute the space, the time, the page faults, the messages sent, the cache misses, the bit flips, and any other reasonable resource that we know and love. So that's all a resource has to satisfy these two simple, innocent axioms. They don't ask for much, these two axioms. Again, namely that for finite computations at halt, it's well defined how much you used of that resource. It's a finite amount, not an infinite amount. And did you compute it somehow, one way or another, by simulation or whatever it is, for halting computations? And it's a decidable quantity. That's it. And if it satisfies these two axioms, all of a sudden, all these theorems that we saw up to now bloom and flourish around that resource, that arbitrary resource that we call phi. That special case could be space. Special case could be time or anything else that you'd like. So these theorems, the complexity classes, there's, there's hierarchies, the denseness theorems, the gap theorem, the hierarchy theorem, the speed up theorem, these are all consequences of these two axioms not of the fact that you're dealing with space or time specifically. Nothing special about space or time. So this generalizes the heck out of complexity theory as if it wasn't general enough already and, and abstract enough. This is called abstract complexity theory. Uh, maybe it's an oxymoron, but you know, maybe it should be called you know, super abstract complexity theory. Complexity theory is abstract enough already. But this abstracts all these theorems 
from space and time specifically and make them apply to any resource, which is kind of amazing, actually. But it sheds a lot of light as to why these things occur. They have nothing to do with space and time, actually. <coughs> they have to do with arbitrary resources that you might consume, which is nice because now you made complexity theory decoupled from the actual machine. So for example, let's say someday one, 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 somebody invents uh, a quantum computer. And that quantum computer doesn't use space and time in a conventional sense. Maybe it consumes, I don't know, quarks. You know, some, you know, maybe it consumes uh, in neutrino state changes, you know, neutrino flips. Some neutrinos can flip into other neutrinos, if you know anything about physics. Neutrinos can sometimes mutate into something else. Maybe it consumes, I don't know, some, some you know, photons or who knows. You know. As long as that whatever it is it consumes, with quarks or photons or neutrinos or whatever, and, you know, satisfies these two quantities, and it probably will, all of a sudden you have quantum complexity theory with all the theorems that we had before automatically without even thinking about it. You have hierarchy theorems, gap theorems, speed up theorems, and complexity classes, quantum complexity classes with respect to that resource. And that's what it means. You know? So, so, you know, so this complexity theory now could be applied to alien machines of some other species that's been around for a billion years that uses very esoteric ways to compute. So for biological computing, you could talk about you know, maybe pr you know, how, mu how many protein uh, Buildups you're doing. How, how many protein uh, molecules you're manufacturing and consuming or breaking down during the computation? Now you have a protein complexity, uh, you know, theory with protein complexity classes and all the way down the line automatically. And we have plenty of protein-based computers, you know, around. Right? Give me an example. You and I, you know. Um, so, so the way we compute also satisfies these axioms, and therefore these complexity classes and resulting theorems and hierarchies. And uh, so, you see how general this is. It's really phenomenally general. Um, it's really machine independent. You know, it's just applied to Turing machines or iPhones or Dells, but also to quantum computers and biological computers and whatever else you know you want to think about. So that was done in the late 60s, it's axiomatic complexity theory. So it's, it's not, again, not new, but it's interesting to have these insights. Yeah, I mean, imagine the kind of mind it takes to look at complexity theory about space and time with the infinite hierarchies and the Chomsky you know, classes and, and, and say, you know, this is not general enough. This is, this is not abstract enough. It's too concrete. And then come up with this. Yeah, it's, that's pretty good. All right. So if you think everything up to now was too abstract, get a load of this. This is an alternation. This is a generalization of non-determinism. Non-determinism is already a generalization of determinism. So if you thought non-determinism was general or too general or general enough, here's something even more general, uh, alternation. So what is alternation? besides saying it's a generalization of non-determinism, now each state can have an existential or universal quantification going over it. And this is done by Stockmeyer and Chandra back in the early 70s, I think, early to mid-70s. So the old way of computing, by old I mean just run-of-the-mill non-deterministic computation, has an existential quantifier at the root of the tree. It says, if there exists a path from this root, you're good. That's what non-determinism means. How are we going to generalize that? Now you can have universal states, not just existential states. Right? So instead of you know, existential, now you have universal states, like for all. And you can use those in your, in your computation tree. So an existential state is accepting if all children of it end up in a final state. If uh, excuse me, existential state accepts if any of its children end up in the final state. But universal state, on the other hand, accepts if all children of it end up in the final state. So it's a for all rather than there exists. And the computation now still looks like a tree, 
But some states are existential, and those are the green ones. So it's color-coded green. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say E on them because they're implicitly and there exists. But some states can be blue, existential, not existential, but universal quantifiers for all. And everything below them must end up in an accepting state for them to be accepting. And it kind of percolates up the tree in the appropriate way. So this, this for all says all paths below it must end up in accepting. And this says all paths below it must end up in accepting. But this one says at least one of them must end up in accepting for this to be accepting. This has only one path below it must end up in accepting, but this must be all of them. And once this and this and this accept, this can accept, because that's, that's a universal quantifier, which is all below me must, must accept. So now you have more power and more generality than just down to feminism, where everything was the existential type, the green type. Now we have blue nodes, too, that are universal. How many understand the definition? So straightforward generalization. Well, straightforward in quotes, because a lot of things follow from this, right? Um, so for example, here, this says one of them, and there's one of them accepting because this is a, a universal, and both of these accept. So that's a for all. So this is satisfied. If this is satisfied, then this is satisfied because that's one of them is now accepting. Here, similar, this is satisfied. So the for all, there's only one below it. So that's satisfied, which means that's satisfied because there exists one that's satisfied. And then here, this is not satisfied, but this is. So this is satisfied because there exists a path below it. And here, there exists a path to here. From here, this accepts which means this accepts, and there's only one below it right here, so then this accepts, and so on and so on. It percolates up, and so this, this, and that all accept. So this accepts, which means this accepts, and the whole thing accepts. So, so it's and, or, and, or. So a universal, you can think about it as, a, um, uh, as an and, an existential uh, is an or, basically. So that's, that's how it works. OK, so with that definition in mind, uh, you have a bunch of results. So now you can have, instead of just a finite automata, a deterministic finite automata, instead of just having a non-deterministic finite automata, you can have an alternating finite automata. The alternating finite automata will generalize the non-deterministic finite automata because its state could, could be either universal or existential. Right? And so why would a k-state alternating finite automata be converted convertible to an equivalent to the k-state non-automatic finite automata, again, you get a power set construction. I'll let you think about the details of that. But you're tracking all possible ways of being in existential and universal states across every level. So in some sense, this is the power set construction converting a, a non-automatic finite automata to the deterministic finite automata. How many recognize this picture and know what it means? Good. Now each one, so there's already two to the n different subsets here. Now, each one of these little circles can either be an existential or universal circle. So it's two to the n circles, and each one can be in two states, in two different types of modes, universal and existential. So it's two to the number of circles across here. So it's two to the two to the n you know, number of super, super duper states, not just super states, but super duper states that can capture all the states that the, that the alternating finite time that could be in. And he'll end up having two to the two to the two to the two to the k state deterministic finite automata. Once you convert the two to the k states non-deterministic finite automata, so you basically apply the power set construction twice. Uh, you nest it with itself twice, or apply it to itself twice. Compose it, I suppose I should say. Compose it twice, and at the end you get a finite automata that's fully deterministic. But that's sort of how this proof goes. Um, So now we have non-automatic finite automata, and now we have altern alternating finite automata, which is the generalization of non-automatic. You can have alternating Turing machines. And the complexity just you know, keeps, comp keeps compounding here. But on the bright side, for Turing machines, alternation doesn't increase the power of Turing machines. 
Why? Because it can keep track of all the paths of the computation with all the possible universal and existential quantifications on all states and keep long track of all that by simulation. You have plenty of tape, infinite amount of tape to, to work with. And eventually, you'll track all the branches of this long computation tree, even though it's alternating much more complicated than just non-deterministic. But still, you can keep track of all of it. It'll take you, you know, two to the two to the k different, you know, amount of time or, or even space. But you can do all that. And so alternation doesn't fundamentally change the nature of Turing machines at all. You can still recognize the same languages as you could before. But you can do it more efficiently, just like non-deterministic machines can do things more efficiently than deterministic machines can. You have unbounded parallelism and all of that. OK, so by simulation, you can make an alternating Turing machine down to a deterministic, you know, regular Turing machine. And it'll do the same thing by simulation. Now, if you have an alternating push and automata, all bets are off. That, that can get you more power than a, than a regular uh, automata, but uh, push and automata. But OK, so now we've defined alternation. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you give a real world example of where alternating is alternation is good? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm about to. Yeah, uh, in a couple of slides. Basically, games. Uh, you know what? I, I'll say it now, since you asked. So when you play a game of chess, and you're looking for the best strategy, not just chess, any game, go, checkers, tic-tac-toe, whatever you'd like, you know, Othello. Uh, let, let's say chess, because most people know what chess is. How do you find the best strategy? Well, the algorithm is relatively s simple, conceptually at least. You want to ask yourself, is there I you're about to begin the first move. You're the first player. So your question is which move to make. And how do you answer which move you should make? You know, of course, let's say you want to win, presumably. Because uh, if you don't want to win, you can make arbitrary moves. It doesn't matter. Right? But if you want to win, you need to answer the question, is there, is there a move? Does there exist a move that you can make right now such that for all counter moves that the opponent makes, there exists another move that you can make then, such as for all counter counter moves that then your opponent makes, there exists a move that then you can do you see where, where the alternation comes in? There exists for all, there exists for all. That's exactly what it is. So if you had an alternating Turing machine or alternating kind of way of computing, in linear time you'd find a way to play perfect chess. Linear in the length of the game, the number of moves. Beautiful, simple. So it captures positional games and any kind of move, counter move kind of scenarios, not just games. You know, economic scenarios, you know, Nash equilibria and game theory, you know. Is there a way to do something now so that no matter what else your adversary does, you can then still do something? So there exists for all, there exists for all the alternating quantifiers. So there's plenty of places where this applies. OK, back to this. Uh, so now, remember how we define the complexity classes, deterministic time, deterministic space, non-deterministic time, non-deterministic space parameterized by functions. Now we can define alternating time and alternating space, which are different than the other classes. So alternating time t of n is all languages decidable in time t of n by some alternating Turing machine that has these quantifiers going on not just a, a non-deterministic Turing machine. Alternating space, same thing, but for space. Alternating Turing machine that's space bounded. Now, alternating polynomial time is all alternating time classes of n to the k for all polynomials n to the k over all k. So now, just like we define p and np, now we define ap. p being deterministic polynomial time, np being non-deterministic polynomial time, ap being alternating polynomial time. Okay. And now you can define alternating polynomial space, very similar to the definition of alternating polynomial time, except for space instead of time. How many understand the definitions? OK, good. And notice again that these are properties, because these are containing decidable languages. So we have alternating exponential time, right? And we have alternating exponential space. We have alternating log space, or AL, or A log space, right? And these are the an analogs of the 
previous complex complexity classes for deterministic and non-deterministic space and time, respectively. And they're all model independent, again, because these definitions um, transcend which computation model you use, whether it's a Dell computer or an iPhone in your pocket, or whether it's a, an, a big abacus. These just differ by a constant factor in terms of their runtimes and their capabilities. They can all simulate one another with a constant loss of speed. That's it, but they can still simulate one another. So you can simulate a supercomputer on your abacus. It won't be very efficient. It won't be a lot of fun. It'll be kind of tedious. I mean, I'm talking about a really big abacus, by the way, you know, with billions of beads on it and so on. But with an abacus, you can simulate arbitrary things. And with, with supercomputers, certainly you can simulate an abacus. So, so, and these all complexity classes are so they're model independent because all these models can simulate all the other models with a constant loss of speed only. Only. I mean, you know, in the case of an abacus simulating a supercomputer, the loss of speed will be, you know, 10 to the 12. But that's still a constant, at least theoretically speaking. All right. So uh, now we have more generality when we compute. Remember that old kind of dorky movie, you know, Snakes, Snakes on a Plane? How many of you ever heard of that? You know, it's kind of, yeah. Not a great movie, but it's good for some laughs. Now we have, you know, <laughs> a sequel called Snakes on Every Plane, you know, so you know, mu much worse than last time, right? So instead of an existential quantifier, a plane, you have now a universal quantifier, every plane, all planes. So that's kind of the difference, kind of, you know couched in a bit of humor here. OK, so with that, um, you can prove simple theorems. And we know that P is a subset of NP. Why? Because non-determinism is a, is a generalization of determinism. Or, or conversely, determinism is a special case of non-determinism. Now here comes AP. Alternating polynomial time contains non-deterministic polynomial time because alternation is a generalization of non-determinism. Or conversely, non-determinism is a special case of alternation. We have just one existential node at the very top, you know, you know or in, in fact, all nodes are existential, so you don't need even universal nodes. Universal quantifiers are nodes. So that's the first simple theorem. But we don't know if NP is equal to AP. That's open. Just like we don't know if P is equal to, to NP. That's open, too. So the alternation will create a whole bunch of new open problems that you haven't seen before. OK? So we don't, know if, we don't even know if P is equal to AP. We don't even know that P and AP are different than each other, even though AP is greatly generalizes NP. Alternation greatly generalizes non-determinism. It could still be the case that P will be equal to AP, that you can simulate arbitrary alternating computations in polynomial time. Uh, you know, uh, arbitrary alternating polynomial time computations in deterministic polynomial time. It's hard to believe that, that, that this could be true, but we can't prove it false. So back to the chess example, you know, if this is true as an open problem, if the two are the same, that means essentially that there'll be efficient polynomial time algorithms to play perfect chess and perfect Go and perfect any other board game that alternates between the two players with perfect information where everybody knows everything there is to know about the board and the moves. There's no probabilities involved like backgammon when you throw dice. That's why you need perfect information. Uh, but if P is equal to AP, P is equal to NP because NP is sandwiched between the two. So if the two ends are the same, NP is equal to either one of them. How many get that? So that's, that's pretty straightforward. It's a corollary. Now, obviously, um, so the deterministic space of f of n is contained in alternating time. Well, I don't know how obvious it is, but alternating time f is contained in the deterministic space f. You can simulate alternating time-bounded computations with no more space than that time-bound is. So that's a one theorem. That's another theorem that the deterministic space f is an alternating time f squared. So there we can prove pretty tight time-space relationships between alternating time and deterministic space. Remember, for, for, um, for, for non-deterministic time, we, 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 we didn't know whether the deterministic space f is contained in non-deterministic time f squared. The best we can do is exponential in f, 2 to the, two to the f. But here, if we have alternating time, you can do more all of a sudden. And, and the, 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 see, let's, let's put it that way. That, that bounds become tighter. 
So if there's an exponential bound here in time, if this was not a determinism, if it's alternation, the bound drops to quadratic. Okay. Uh, so I'm just giving you a bunch of theorems in quick succession. We're not going to spend a lot of time proving this, but if you want to do a deeper dive into this, feel free. And you know, there's a lot of this in the Sipser book and in many other places. Uh, we can show that polynomial space, deterministic polynomial space, is equal to non-deterministic polynomial space. That's a, a, a corollary of Savage's theorem. And we can show that both of them, equal to each other, uh, are subsets of alternating polynomial space, but it's still open if they're equal or not. Okay. But we do know that alternating space F is contained in the deterministic time C to the F. That much we know, that you can only get a, bl a, a, a uh, exponential blow up in time to simulate a uh, certain sp alternating space bounded computation. Here's a theorem that we don't know otherwise if it wasn't for the alternation here. Alternating logarithmic space is equal to polynomial time. That you can prove, actually. Uh, for non-deterministic logarithmic space, we don't know if it's equal to polynomial time. That's still open. But for alternating, so alternating time, in some sense, closes a lot of the gaps and answers a lot of the open questions if you substitute alternation for non-determinism. So alternating polynomial time is equal to polynomial space. If it wasn't for this A here, this will be an open question. Uh, we don't know if deterministic polynomial time is equal to polynomial space. We don't even know if non-deterministic polynomial time is equal to polynomial space. But we do know that alternating polynomial time is equal to polynomial space. That you can prove. Uh, alternating polynomial space is equal to exponential time. You, you can already see the pattern. Alternating space of one kind is equal to the exponential of that in time in the other category, the other resource um, category. So alternating, spa alternating logarithmic spec is equal to polynomial time. Alternating polynomial time is equal to polynomial space. Alternating uh, excuse, excuse me, alternating polynomial time is equal to polynomial space. Alternating polynomial space is equal to exponential time, and it keeps <laughs> going like that. <clears throat> alternating exponential time is equal to exponential space. So alternation is a very nice way of tying together space and time classes that we couldn't tie together without alternation. Uh, so a lot of problems aren't open here. Others still are, but some problems close, close up nicely. Some space and time complexity classes collapse, and you can easily show equivalences, whereas you couldn't show them before. Uh, so here's a problem, quantified Boolean formulas. So given a quantified Boolean formula with existential and universal quantifiers sprinkled in it, does it evaluate to true? So this is a quantified version of SAT. So remember, SAT we talked about, now we'll talk more about it to, in this class too, satisfiability. I give you a Boolean formula, and I ask, is there a way to satisfy the formula by assigning certain values to all the variables? Each variable is a Boolean variable, so it's either true or false. Here, you're allowed universal and existential quantifiers. For example, I say, for all x, does there exist a y and a z such that x, n, y, or z is true? Is this formula true, given these universal and existential constraints on it? So it's not just SAT, it's quant quantified SAT, quantified existentially and universally. All right, so it's, it's called QSAT sometimes for quantified satisfiability. Now, satisfiability is a special case of this when all of these are there exists, right? There exists, does there exist an X, and does there exist a Y, and does there exist a Z such that this is true? So how many can see that SAT is a special case of QSAT? Okay, only half of you. All right, I'll take it. Um, so it turns out that quantified Boolean satisfiability is polynomial space complete. Uh, and we haven't talked about completeness formally yet, but, but we will. We talk about Cook's theorem and CARP's results and NP completeness in general. And P space completeness is just one more completeness theory aside from polynomial time completeness or non deterministic polynomial time completeness, NP completeness. Every complexity class has a completeness theory associated with it. So there's P completeness, NP completeness, P space completeness, exponential time completeness. You know, these are classes of problems that are as hard as it gets within that complexity class, whether it's for space or time. So we can certainly uh, establish whether Boolean formula, quantified Boolean formula, is true or not simply by trying all the possibilities. So that's why it's in the deterministic time to the end, right? Evaluate all the possibilities, create the truth table, and then you'll know. And certainly you can do it in the deterministic space linear. 
You know, it doesn't take you more than linear space to try all possibilities. You just cycle through all of them. It doesn't take much space. It takes a bunch of time, but not a bunch of space. Okay, so those two theorems are um, pretty straightforward by simple simulation. Now, it turns out that you can do it in alternating linear time. In linear time, you can answer this question because the computation already is set up for you here. Does there, you know, is it true that for all x, that's a universal quantification state. Uh, there exists a y, so it's an existential state following that and so on. And so in linear time, um, you can answer a quantified Boolean formula instance. How many can see that? In alternating linear time, linear time using alternation. How many see that? Uh, just two of you? Uh, you won't ask me any questions. I mean, I've been kind of doing a monologue here for a while. Yeah, question. Here? Well, so uh, just like in, in what would be constant time? You mean evaluating this right here? This, this, this whole thing without the quotes. So it won't be constant time. I, in, if you use alternation, it will be linear time because you have to change linear number of states. One state, two states, three states, one for every variable, and there's n variables. Uh, just, 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 like, just like SAT without this quantification, if this was just a SAT instance, you can solve it in linear non-deterministic time. Guess the x, then guess the y, then guess the z. You know, plug them all in, see if it works, you're good. If there's a path to success, you will find it. And non-deterministically, that's the definition of acceptance. If there exists a path to success, you're good. Here, it's quantified, but if you use alternation, alternation itself is a quantified <coughs> computation with every state is a universal or existential quantification over all the states that succeeded or below it in this computation tree. So the point, you know, intuitively, alternation is beautifully geared toward these kind of situations that have alternating quantifications already built into the question, just like in chess. In chess, is, is there a move that you can make as a first player? So does there exist a move that you can make such that for all moves that I make, there exists a move that you make, such that for all moves that I make, there exists a move and back and forth and back and forth. And after a linear number of these questions back and forth, I'll know if there's a way to, to win or not before I even make my first move. You know, I feel like I'm making gang signs or something. It's, it's, sh sh probably shouldn't do that. Uh, does that make sense? So, so alternating computations are beautifully tailored to this kind of alternating quantification kind of exchanges, whether they're about games or satisfying formulas or playing what if kind of scenarios and so on. Uh, OK. So here, here's what I was going to say earlier about you know, what I already did say about chess. Right, so uh, that quantifiable Boolean formulas naturally models winning strategies in positional games, right? Using you know involving two players, like tic-tac-toe. So again, taking a simpler example than chess, does there exist a move where you can put your piece such that no matter where the adversary puts their piece, right? Then there exists a move that then you can put another piece such that whenever the adversary moves their piece and back and forth and back and forth such that you'll end up with a winning position for you. So that's a beautiful, you know, alternating kind of a, you know, uh, quantification kind of a couching of this problem of how to win at a positional game, whether it's chess, go, tic-tac-toe, checkers, you know, whatever. You know, there's, there's hundreds of different games that this applies to. Uh, I mean, real life games that we actually play you know, each other with. So it turns out that generalized checkers is exponential time complete. Uh, generalized chess, same thing. Generalized go is exponential time complete as well. And uh, generalized Othello is polynomial space complete. Um, and it has to be generalized, which means the, the board has to be arbitrary size. So the instance is, is a board size n. So you can easily play Go on an N. How many play Go, by the way, or know how to play Go? So you know you can play it on an N by N board. It doesn't have to be you know, 19 by 19 or, or 5 by 5. It could be any size you want, and the game still remains the same. The strategies all remain the same. I mean, the smaller the board is, the more trivial the game becomes. 
and the larger the board is, the more complicated it gets. But so it's easy to generalize Othello or Go or even checkers. Imagine checkers on a, instead of an 8 by 8 board, it'll be a 32 by 32 board. Same rules, just a bigger board. Chess is a little bit hard to generalize. How many, how many heard of generalized chess or play generalized chess? How would you think you would generalize chess? Because we just said it's obvious to generalize checkers, Go, and Othello, and other things, and even tic tac. Tic tac toe is highly generalizable, too. So, so there's a lot of different ways you can go. So let's say you play chess instead of on an 8 by 8 board here, you play it on a 16 by 16 board. What's an obvious way to generalize? Double every, Double every piece, right? So you have two rooks and you know, two knights and two bishops and blah, blah, blah. No. Or there's other ways to generalize it. You, you can have four-player chess. So imagine a chess board. It's not quite square. You have two rows here, two rows here, and two rows here, and two rows here. That's four players. Each one has the standard set of pieces, but each one is off to the side, and the 8 by 8 in the middle is clear. And they're all playing against each other. The last king standing wins. Now, that's a much more interesting game of chess, four players. How many have seen that, heard of it? OK, there's tournaments using that, four players play. It gets a lot more complicated than regular chess, because now you can form alliances. You can collude right, with your you know, opponents or with your teams. And, and alliances can be formed and then broken, and you can have you know, people kind of double you know, backstab you, like pretend to collude with you, and then kill your king anyway, just because, you know, just like in real life. You know, there's all sorts of betrayals going on. You can have all sorts of treaties and alliances. And, um, or you can generalize chess other interesting ways. So here's another even cooler way to generalize chess. You, you have new pieces that move in different ways. So you can think about, so, so a rook moves horizontally and vertically, right? But um, a bishop moves diagonally. But if you take a rook and a bishop and you superpose them and combine them into one piece, which piece is that? Queen. So a queen can move like a rook or a bishop at its option. What about combining other pieces? What if you can combine a rook with a knight, or a bishop, um, a bishop with a uh, with a rook, and you might might want to call it an archbishop, and that's a whole new piece that moves in a different way all of a sudden. Uh, so you can generalize it lots, of, or you can make it three-dimensional chess. I mean, you see Star Trek, Mr. Spark always plays three-dimensional chess with whoever. You know. Okay, so, so you know, generalizations are not unique, but the point is it's got to be a whole family of different size boards. Otherwise, if the board is finite, it's only an 8 by 8 the game tree is finite and fixed. And how long does it take to find an optimal strategy for fixed chess? 8 by 8 constant time. Very big constant, don't get me wrong, 10 to the 50 or 10 to the 60 or whatever, but constant nevertheless. So that's why it's got to be generalized to arbitrary sizes. OK, any questions about this, any of this? So we, you know, we started by talking about alternation and how alternation naturally maps to two-player positional games of complete knowledge. And All right, here's another interesting generalization and abstraction. And many open problems come from this, too. So you can take alternation, and you can bound the number of existential and universal states now. So before you could have any number of alternating universal and existential states, but now you can have at most i, no more than i. So you can say that a sigma sub i alternating Turing machine has at most i quantified steps that alternate, at uh, most i runs of quantified steps. But it's got to start with the existential steps. So at the root of a tree, there's a big e there exists some path. And then later, you can start alternating to for all and then back to exists. So whenever you alternate from there exists to a for all, that's an alternation. That's why it's called alternating, actually, because it alternates from there exists to for all, or at least it has the option of alternating. Not the obligation to alternate, but the option to alternate. Now, similarly, uh, pi sub i is an alternating Turing machine that has at most i alternations of quantifiers. Right? But the, the root must start with a universal quantifier. I'm co color coding it, by the way. Universal is blue. Existential is green, just if you haven't noticed that already. It's color coded. So, th so this here 
a is a uh, uh, i is equal to one because this is an existential. The, the, the circle ones are existential. The square ones are universal. So we start with an existential, then alternate to universal. We stay with the universal, so that's not an alternation right here. But then it alternates back to a, a existential, so that's i is equal to 3 because we alternate it again. Then we alternate back to universal, then back to existential. So there were five alternations along this path. That's what I mean by alternations. You switch from one to the other. Okay. And similarly, uh, uh, you have other definitions. So, you know, pi sub i and sigma sub i alternation battle Turing machines are similar to unbounded alternation, alternating Turing machines, but you have <coughs> this bound on the alternation. So, so if the bound is five, you cannot have more than five alternations along any path. And then you run out, and you, and you can stay with whatever the last alternation was and keep going, but you can't alternate back. You can't switch back. Okay. So, Sigma i time t of n is all decidable languages. It's, a, it's another complexity class. All decidable languages that run within time t on some sigma sub i alternating Turing machine. Alternating Turing machine that has this bound i on the number of alteration, and it starts with a universal quantifier, the green one, not the blue one. That's the, uh, it starts with an existential quantifier, green, not the universal one that's blue. And similarly, sigma sub i space it's the same definition, but for space bounded, not for time bounded, sigma sub i computation. And you get the next two for time, pi sub i time and pi sub i space. So it's four sets of classes, of complexity classes, uh, parameterized by uh, alternating computations that are i bounded, that start either with existential or universal at the root of the tree. Now, I know it's a mouthful, it's a lot of you know, definitions, but they're all parallel definitions, they're all similar to one another, they're slightly different based on whether it's space or time, and whether they start with a universal or existential initial state at the root of the tree. Now you can define uh, sigma sub i polynomial time as the union of all polynomial time sigma i complexity classes, and the same for space, and for the pi's same thing. So you can have now sigma sub i p and pi sub i p. That's i bounded alternating computations that allow only i alternations between universal and existential quantifiers. And you can define the sigma polynomial hierarchy as the union over all sigma sub i p and the pi polynomial hierarchy, p a stands for polynomial hierarchy as the union of all pi sub i p. And remember, these, 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 are, these are what the pi sub i's and the sigma sub i's are. Now, I know these are a lot of definitions and they compound, but you can easily show that the sigma polynomial hierarchy is the same as the pi polynomial hierarchy. So if you allow arbitrary number of um, alternations, it doesn't matter if you start with a universal or an existential, because you keep switching and there's no bound. And so you're good either way. So that's just called a polynomial hierarchy. Um, and languages in this complexity class PH are all languages accepted by polynomial time unbounded alternating Turing machines. So this is the analog of P and P space, if you will, you know, either one. Okay. So it turns out you can easily show that sigma sub zero P is basically the same as p, because it means there's no alternation. And you start with an existential or universal, but you don't, you're not allowed any alternation, so it's the same as just p. Now, if you allow to start with a single alternation, and you start with an existence state, an, an existential state at the starting state, p, that's simply np. Because NP is one alternation, just the existence, existential at the top. And if there exists a path to some, you know, you're good. That's what non-automatism is. So sigma 1P is the same as NP. And sigma and, and pi 1P is the same as co-NP, the complement of languages in NP. And if you allow more alternations, you can always do more, not less. 
So each complexity class that allows one more alternation than the previous class allows you more languages or functions to compute, not less, because you have more resources you can expend, but maybe a little more, but certainly not less. So you have these <coughs> obvious containments here. So these are all theorems, easy to prove. It's trivial, actually. And it turns out that sigma ip is containing pi i plus 1 p and vice versa. You can show that that's true. And you can show that sigma ip is containing p space. Anything, any alternating computation, any bounded alternating computation you can do in polynomial time, you can do in polynomial space. It's not hard to do. You just simulate it the hard way or look at all possibilities. And you can show that all of polynomial hierarchy is in p space because every level of it is. So that, that's a consequence of these two theorems. But we don't know if the polynomial hierarchy is equal to p space. There could be things in p space that are more than just in any of these classes whose union is equal to the polynomial hierarchy. We don't even know at the first level if sigma 0 p is equal to sigma 1 p, because sigma 0 p is p, and sigma 1 p is n p. So this level of the hierarchy at the very beginning, the, the first level is equal to the second level, is equivalent to p is equal to np, because that's what these two classes are. And of course, pi 0 p is equal to pi 1 p is equivalent to p is equal to co np, which is also open. And you can generalize it to any level. So we don't even know if sigma 1 p is equal to pi 1 p, because that's the same as p is equal to co np problem, which is another open problem. And at any level k, we don't know if sigma kp is equal to sigma k plus 1p. In other words, if one more level of alternation will, strictly speaking, buy you more recognition power. We don't know that either. That's still open for every k. So th there's an infinite number of open problems right here, and another infinite problem of open problems right here, another infinite uh, sequence of open problems right there for the pi version. Start, you know, all, all pi means that you start with an existential, with a universal rather than an existential, which is what the sigma is. So in other, in other words, we just pile on here a huge amount of new open problems, none of which we know the answer to. How many understand what these problems even mean? Never mind <laughs> what the solutions are. These are open problems. All right, any, any questions about all of these open problems? So these are all open problems involving alternation, in particular bounded alternation which is a generalization of non-determinism. So you see that p is equal to np is just one of an infinite number of open problems. It's just the one that most people like to talk about. And it's the very first one. It's the one at the very zeroth level of this hierarchy, each level of which has open problems of its own, none of which are, have ever been solved yet. So it's, it's really quite amazing. You know, so there's an infinite number of p is equal to op type p is equal to np type questions right there of two different categories, actually three different categories. This category, this category, and that category. This category compares every sigma to the next sigma. Every, this category compares every pi to the next pi. This category compares sigmas to pi's at every level. And all of these are open. None of those have been ever settled in the affirmative or the negative. Okay. But we know the polynomial hierarchy is equal to all the languages expressible by second order logic. That somebody was able to prove. And we don't even know if the polynomial hierarchy is infinite. We define it as an infinite hierarchy. Every class, when we define a polynomial hierarchy, you know, using the sigmas and the, and the pi's, right, there was an infinite number of classes, sigma and pi, one for every integer. Right? There was sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, all the way up. Right? For every k, there was a sigma sub that. So that kind of suggests that the, it's an infinite hierarchy, but it may not be. That's another open question. So we don't know if the polynomial hierarchy is infinite. It could be that it collapses. All of it collapses to p, or all of it collapses to p space, or something like that. Uh, but we do know for sure that if any two consecutive levels coincide, everything above those levels collapses to those two levels. That much we can prove. So it could be intermediate between complete collapse and complete infinite proper hierarchy. It could collapse at some level and above. All those levels could collapse to level number 17, say. 
that's not very likely because you know before everything could collapse to level number 17 because there's nothing magic about 17 necessarily if it does collapse it'll probably collapse to zero or one level uh, so if p is equal to np then the whole thing completely collapses and the whole thing is equal to p so that's a consequence a corollary if p is equal to np that the entire polynomial hierarchy collapses to p and if p is equal to np that implies that p is equal to the polynomial hierarchy, therefore. So if you want to show that p is not equal to np, all you got to show is that p is not equal to the polynomial hierarchy. Because if they are the same, p is equal to the polynomial hierarchy. So if you can show that p is not equal to the entire polynomial hierarchy, p not equal to np will be a simple corollary of that. And you'll win your million dollars from the Clay Institute of Mathematics. You'll probably get a Turing Award right away. And you don't have to worry about your PhD. Uh, so that's an even harder problem than p is not equal to np, whether p is equal to the polynomial hierarchy. Right? Now, there exist certain oracles that if you had access to them and use them as a subroutine, that separates levels of the polynomial hierarchy at any level k. So that much we know. And we also know that polynomial hierarchy contains all the well-known complexity classes in p space, including p and np and co -NP and bounded polynomial time probabilistic Turing machines and, you know, and so on. So we don't know whether it collapses. And if it does collapse, at what level it collapses. These are all open questions. Um, but we do know if it collapses, if, if, if one level is equivalent to the next level, everything above that does collapse to that level. And below that, it may not collapse. So there's a whole slew of open problems there. Any questions? I mean, I know it's a lot to take in. You know, I mean, you thought non-determinism was bad enough, and now you see a whole generalization beyond non-determinism called alternation, and there's a whole bunch of new results and open questions, and p is equal to np is the tip of this giant, much larger iceberg than, than just non-determinism. Yeah? How do you define uh, BPP with this polynomial hierarchy? Uh, I'm going to talk about that separately. Yeah, BPP is somewhere, somewhere in there, and, you know, Crypto uses a lot of BPP type randomized randomization algorithms. I'll, I'll mention more explicitly about BPP separately. It's coming up very soon, actually. So back to the Chomsky hierarchy reloaded. Uh, here's what we had before, the context free, the context sensitive, polynomial space. Now we know about exponential time. Exponential space is all decidable. There's infinite hierarchies all over the place. And here are some of the hierarchies. You know, so where's the polynomial hierarchy in all of this? Well, it's between p and p space. So it's right around this region here, the polynomial hierarchy. Right? So wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. There it is. OK, the polynomial hierarchy. So it sits nicely between p and p space. We don't know exactly if it collapses or not. So this is now not kind of a Venn diagram anymore, necessarily, because it may collapse all the way to p. And p space could be larger than p. And you know, so we kind of. You know, these infinite hierarchies are no longer Venn diagram diagraminess. You know, they kind of lose their Venn diagraminess. I think I just made up a <laughs> phrase in English. Um, but I hope, I hope you know what, what this depicts now. Um, and now we get into BPP. Uh, but I suppose <laughs> we should first take a break and then talk about, you know, deterministic Turing machines and coin flips and the use of randomness and so on. So these are Turing machines that can flip coins and use randomness. And in crypto, this, this is used quite a bit, um, the notion of randomness and coin flipping and pseudo-random number generators and so on. OK, let's take a 15-minute break, come back, and continue with, this, with these cool topics. All right.